I sentence you to either 30 days in county jail or 30 minutes listening to Fanboy. Wow, freakazoid, cool. Hey, I was just talking to Harlan on the internet, and I told him I hadn't seen a good cyberspace scene like this one since Tron, which is not the film that broke the bank at Disney in 1983, as some believe. No, Tron came out in 82, three years after Disney's The Black Hole, which was Movie Land's equivalent to the Hindenburg. What a disaster! And the robots? They made R2-D2 look like Lawrence Olivia. Lock me up and throw away the key! <sighs> being a fan is exhausting. In an ideal world, being a fan should mean that you're excited about something that you love. But a lot of times, it just seems to be more about being severely cynical to mask how much dread you're filled with. Based not on what you need, but what you think you want. Either way, there's an emotional investment, and it can be all-consuming. That in itself becomes exhausting. Myself, personally, I have been on both sides of that. As I have gotten older, I would rather indulge the kid in me to become more excited, or at the very least be optimistic about the thing I'm a fan of, but goddamn, people sure do love to piss on things to let you know you have no right to be excited. It really is strange. This goes across all media. Music, movies, comic books. Each medium has their fair share of snobs that love to flex their correct opinion and tell you how absolutely wrong you are, because there is no nuance, no perspective, it is simply black and white. When it comes to the world of comic books and comic book movies, there truly isn't a better example of this than Zack Snyder's superhero films. There are fans that absolutely love his work, and then there's people that absolutely hate it. It is obscene how much his work in the DC Universe is discussed, endlessly, with the same talking points made over and over and over again. His work on the DC Universe started 10 years ago, starting with The Man of Steel. I want to sit down, examine each of his three films, dive in and see what the big deal is. Why do people take his films so personally? Why do people find it offensive? Why do they love it so much? All I can offer is my thoughts and perspectives, because I do actually love these films. I am not overtly obsessed, but I can say for myself personally, they are some of my all-time favorite films. I want to see how his work contrasts to what came before, in terms of comic book movies, but to also see how it gels, or how it doesn't, from the source material it was taken from. So let's start at the beginning, with the superhero who started it all. Superman is such an icon. I think for anybody that truly loves superhero comics, they have to have an affinity for this character. He is such a beautiful yet simple idea. The idea that anybody can be good and can do the impossible. Not because of some extraordinary abilities, but by example of being an honest, decent human being. The ironic thing about Superman is somehow the right thing and being a good person is a deeply nuanced and complicated idea to explore. Since his incarnation, for lack of a better phrase, Superman has always been a progressive social justice warrior. That's pretty astounding, considering he is a comic book character passed down by many writers who have their own ideas and their own agendas. In nearly a hundred years, there's been so many iterations, so many changes and points of growth for the character. For example, originally he could run and jump really far. He wasn't able to fly until the radio show The Adventures of Superman. And then it was implemented into the comics. Also Kryptonite, the green rock that weakens Superman, was also a contribution made by the radio show. Lex Luthor, funny enough, I don't think people realize, wasn't always a Trump allegory slash businessman that the mainstream always known him as. The businessman allegory was established in 1985 during Superman's reboot. Granted, we're coming up 40 years on that, but relatively, that's a recent addition. For the first 50 years of his existence, he was just a mad scientist who stole 40 cakes. Superman, over the course of his existence, had some major highs into the pulp culture zeitgeist. Superman debuted in 1938 in Action Comics No. 1. In less than five years, it didn't take long for the character to take off. Not only to be adapted, but have these new explorations of media add into the mythos. By 1940, a merely two years later, Superman had his own radio show called The Adventures of Superman. By that next year, the legendary Max Fleischer cartoons debuted. 
which to note deeply influenced the beloved Batman the Animated Series. Superman has always mattered in some sense, whether it was boxing an iconic celebrity, being the chosen character for the first company crossover between the big two. Within a 20 year time span, Superman had four TV shows that included two live action shows that people actually remember. He had a legendary death that became newsworthy. I mean, even SNL made a joke about it when he became blue for a minute. There's not a lot of characters that you can say that about. So the prospects of a Superman movie seems like a no-brainer. But even then, it's still something that people argued hasn't been done right. Now, when it comes to comic book movies, they in themselves are a fascinating beast. They sort of come in waves in terms of style and tone. One sets the trend that begets the others. For example, you could argue the success of the Ninja Turtles paved the way for the 90s to pursue comic book movies based on indie books. In the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a trifecta of these three movies combined pushed the other to go the distance in what you can do with technology in a superhero story, starting with Blade and perfecting it in Spider-Man. After that, the floodgate opened for what was possible. By 2008, there was a distinct junction point where there wasn't just one trend center, but two. First you had Iron Man, which kicked off the Marvel Cinematic Universe, setting the template of what a fun comic book movie should do. But then you had The Dark Knight. And by every right, it is a wonderful, wonderful film. It is one of my all-time favorites. However, it set this false impression that most creators had. If they wanted their movie to be taken seriously, to be truly elevated, they had the chase after The Dark Knight. It was kind of like the original Halloween. After that movie came out, the slasher genre took everything superficial, like the sex, the blood, a holiday theme, and applied it to their movie thinking it would translate to success, which only worked once. Exactly once. And in this case, if your superhero flick wasn't a romping good time, it had to be dark. It had to be moody. It had to be serious. Which, as you can imagine, had varied degrees of success. Man of Steel and Zack Snyder's other DC work probably the biggest example of this. However, you could argue that Man of Steel was more of a genuine attempt, in that Christopher Nolan, the writer and director of The Dark Knight, was directly involved with Man of Steel, serving as a producer and worked on the story. Now, Superman in particular was in a weird place up to this point. In the realm of movies, Superman the first movie made a huge splash in 1978. It was charming, delightful, wholesome, downright perfection in terms of movie magic, with a lovable cast and strong sense of direction for Superman. But already by the second film, there were some production issues, where the director, Richard Donner, was fired and replaced by Richard Lester. Richard Donner's cut of the film didn't see the light of day until 20 years after Superman 2's release in 1982. I like both versions a lot, but personally I like the Donner cut just a bit more. After that, the film series takes another sidestep with Superman 3. It's goofy, but not completely off the rails. However, it truly becomes diminishing returns by the time we get to Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. That literally killed Superman movies for the next 20 years. It wasn't until the mid-2000s we got to see The Man of Tomorrow on the big screen again, with the appropriately named Superman Returns. Personally, I really like Superman Returns a lot. I like Brandon Routh in the role. I understand the criticisms. I understand that it's a shame that the first Superman movie in 20 years is basically a sequel to a series that was literally a generation ago, with a tone, style, and attitude that's displaced. As such, Superman sat again in limbo until Christopher Nolan got involved. At the time, a Nolan-inspired Superman movie sounded incredible after what he did with Batman. When it was announced that Zack Snyder was going to be the director, I think it was safe to say, for me at least, I was very trepidatious. And oh boy, little did I know. Not only would it be a turning point for me, but I think comic book fans in general. Full transparency, I was not excited about this movie. I was very, very, very skeptical of Zack Snyder directing this. I wasn't a big fan of 300, and I did not like Watchmen at all. With that said, in retrospect after rewatching both movies, I actually do like 300 a lot more nowadays, but Watchmen? I respect the attempt, still not crazy about it. The idea of Snyder handling Superman was not something I was exactly thrilled about, especially since 
personally, I was looking forward to the world of Superman Returns continuing. Regardless, I still went that Friday morning, June 14th, to watch Man of Steel, and by the end, my jaw was on the floor. I was in utter disbelief that this movie was real. I was obsessed with it. I remember touting this movie, telling everyone I knew to go watch it. To my surprise, met with mixed results. I knew people that saw what I saw and loved it, but there were others that questioned my credibility as a film lover. Which still makes me laugh because I don't think of myself to have any sense of credibility. I like what I like and I don't make apologies for it. I love stuff that sparks intrigue, that can be subversive, toes the line of depravity, that can invite conversation. There are some storytelling touchstones that I favor over others, but I like stories that try to be different, that attempts to challenge and at the very least break the mold. More importantly, I will love anything that is genuine and earnest. That doesn't always mean it has to be dark and brooding. Calling back to Superman Returns, I see it as a genuine attempt to be a tribute to those classic Superman movies, and I do adore it for that. When it came to Man of Steel, there were things about it that I immediately got what it was trying to do, and I was engaged by it. Starting off with the 20 minute prologue on Krypton, the funny thing is, I feel this sequence has gotten better with age in that comparatively the time and effort put into this world has weight and gravity to it. And for Krypton to be crafted, frankly, on a soundstage with heavy CGI, I think is noteworthy because it feels so concrete. That kind of attention makes a world of difference. Unfortunately, you can't say that with a lot of movies nowadays. So something I'll be upfront about. I think Superman, out of any comic book character, has the best origin. There is something so simple, yet multifaceted. What I mean by that is if you look at Batman or Spider-Man, one day they were normal everyday people until something happened and they became a hero. Superman has the inverse. He is already Superman. For him, this is more about self-discovery and how to integrate himself into the world. And honestly, looking at it through the lens of Superman as a coming-of-age story, he is incredibly relatable. I don't care how many iterations between comics, TV, movies, I never get tired of his origin. I think the best storytellers understand that aspect about how relatable he truly is, because at the end of the day, we are all trying to fit in. And Man of Steel makes a genuine attempt at that. A story about a kid who doesn't understand what is happening when his development starts and he panics. A story about finding your place in the world and where you belong in it. A story about where your loyalties lie. A story about if the world is worth saving. For Superman, that's a radical concept, especially when in this case, it's a coming of age, where Superman has to learn about his own morals and why he has them. Now, I'm not going to argue that Man of Steel is a perfect movie, but there are no perfect movies. This is entertainment. This is art. Imperfections, blemishes, ideally is what makes it unique. It's what adds the flavor. Man of Steel, and this is a trend with a lot of superhero flicks, runs on the edge of being offensive, which is absurd, but also kind of funny. Something I'm always curious about is at what point does a movie lose somebody? What's that scene or moment where things go from, okay, I like this movie, to, oh no, I don't. Granted, it can be a steady decline of enjoyment. It could be immediate. But there is always a scene or a moment, something that confirms it. I never can quite pinpoint with people when it comes to Man of Steel, but if I had to guess, this scene would be the one to point to. For context, young Clark is getting picked on while riding on a bus full of his classmates. The tires pop and the entire bus goes into the river. Clark saves everyone. Pa Kent talks to Clark about keeping his powers a secret, and then this happens. Right, we talked about this. You have, oh, Clark, you have to keep this side of yourself a secret. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. I remember reacting to that scene thinking, holy shit, was that really in this movie? I can understand why this is something that immediately rubs people the wrong way. It's a choice, and an important one at that, because this scene tells you everything going forward about Zack Snyder's vision. It's cynical, it's honest, and kind of sacrilege. The Kents in all other forms are this paradigm of selflessness and kindness, 
something that Clark learns from and bases his integrity on. But instead, Paw is a cynic, who would rather let people die, and himself, if it means protecting his kid from being exposed by a cynical world. This is a grossly cynical line. I get that. But it got me invested. It created intrigue. I thought it was such a fascinating and bold thing to do, especially with Superman. And that is something worth noting. Dark, moody, sad, cynical Superman, that's nothing new. It almost never works because it's superficial. It's about the idea itself instead of actually having something to say. But I honestly feel like Man of Steel actually had something to say. You know, that it's trying to establish a moral foundation for Clark to believe in. Earlier in the film, when we meet adult Clark on the boat, he's about to be crushed, and a random guy on the ship saves him. And he says this. Watch it, dumbass! Keep your eyes open, you're gonna get squashed! And it's funny, but it perfectly encapsulates the theme of this movie. Men can be good, but can also be assholes. It's funny, this film was truly Zack's mission statement of what he wanted going forward in terms of themes, but scope as well. We get things like the Battle of Smallville, and the 30-40 minute climax in Metropolis Disaster Palooza, which, I'm not gonna lie, I'm all in. Disaster porn in these big blockbuster films, they happen all the time, it's almost a staple now. But there's something about how this is orchestrated, at least for me, on an emotional level that gets me every time I watch it. Particularly this scene with Perry White trying to save Jenny, and he realizes he can't do it, so he accepts their fate. That right there, I think truly brings a humanity to all this chaos. That to me makes the entire thing work. I will elaborate further down the line in another video, but I find that Snyder in particular has a really good sense of how to craft an action scene that can be so engaging, so thrilling, and even emotional. It gives me a serotonin, a satisfaction with the indulgence in the bombardment of CGI Action Fest. Which brings us to the ending. Probably the biggest thing this film was remembered for. The biggest sin committed in our fragile little hearts. Superman snapping Zod's neck. My jaw was on the floor. I felt like a fragile child, thinking, Superman doesn't do that. Superman doesn't kill. But it happened. He did it. This was truly a dividing line for people. And as a bloodthirsty, cynical superhero fan that I am, this made me love the film. I love the boldness, the chaos this simple scene invoked for fans. The idea of a superhero killing is a heated topic that has no room for moral ambiguities or nuance. It's a very black or white situation. I do believe this was the thing that broke the series for people going forward. In an ideal world, yes, it'd be very simple and clean cut. But even in comic books, superheroes have killed, even Superman himself. And that was met with criticism. Superheroes, it's a fantasy, a projection of an idealized world where nothing is complicated. Heroes are stalwart and true. Because once a superhero kills, it invites a sense of reality. A reality that, preferably, we would not like to mix with our escapist world. I, on the other hand, will take it all in. I love escapist fantasy, but sometimes that falls into a line of cookie-cutting storytelling. In Nolan's original story, Zod was meant to survive and be thrown into the Phantom Zone with the other Kryptonian criminals. But it was Snyder and Goyer's choice to have Zod not only avoid the Phantom Zone, but led into this battle to the death. For me, it works. I think it adds stakes. It made lines like this. There's only one way this ends, Cal. Either you die, or I do. Have a bit more bite to it. It makes the fight matter. If it didn't happen, I think it would have betrayed everything the film was setting out to do. The film showcases how difficult it is to be an idealized Superman in a complicated world. It also sets the stage for Clark's journey to try to figure out what the right thing is, and building his moral foundation. That's a story I think is worth telling. It's more than what a lot of superhero movies, hell, even a lot of big budget movies in general, would give us. I applaud it for that. In this world, kindness and generosity is met with such gross cynicism. I always admired this movie for being honest about it, especially through a character like Superman. Is it too much? Maybe. Is it a little too close for comfort? Probably. Was it unnecessary? Well, I think that's where the division lies. 
Perhaps that was too much for a comic book audience. And this will come up and I will make comparisons, but the biggest complaint between the DCEU and the MCU is the amount of joy. The amount of levity. People don't like to be reminded of the world they live in. They want to escape. Which is reflected by the financial success between the two of them. And that's fair. I think they both have their merits. Personally, I like something with a little more teeth. I like something that I can relate to, or at least make me feel like I'm not alone when recognizing how mean-spirited this place can be at times. Because when I think it comes to the genuine heroics of a hero, their actions truly shine through as a beacon of light. It makes the heroics feel earned, and the fact that this movie got away with that in a Superman movie of all things, well, I gotta give Snyder his props for not only following through, but continuing this tone throughout his series of films. And love him or hate him, you could say what you want, but this man was committed to his vision, 